Thank you all so much. It's an indeed an honor for me to introduce our guest speaker today. David Biorino Gonzalez is president of the board of directors and CEO of the Farm Worker Institute of Education and Leadership Development Field Institute. Educational nonprofit organization founded by the labor and civil rights leader Cesar Chavez in 1978. David also happens to be the son-in-law of Cesar and Helen Chavez and is also the grandson of Juan de Dios Gonzalez, a farm worker organizer in San Diego, who in 1930 led the nation's first successful desegregation lawsuit and school boycott efforts known as the Lemon Grove Incident. Look it up. Look it up. So I don't believe that he had much of a choice. Fighting for civil rights, leadership, organizing, coalition building is firmly rooted in his heart and in his soul. As the CEO of Field Institute, David directs a $7 million annual budget that includes a high school charter school for 400 adults called Epic de Cesar Chavez, a statewide English as a second language program located in over 23 campuses around California, and a youth environmental conservation corps that employs youth and young adults all over California for jobs. Together, the programs annually serve over 7,000 farm workers, immigrants, young adults, children, and families. Since 2002, Field has served an estimated 55,000 people in California's agricultural regions in San Joaquin, Salinas, Sacramento, and Coachella Valleys. That's amazing. I can go on and on about David's accomplishments, but I know that you'd rather hear from him himself. It is again my honor and privilege to welcome David Viorino Gonzalez. Good afternoon. When uh, they put this black robe on me, I kind of felt like a Superior Court judge, and I was going to say and find out who could, have, who could relate with this by saying, all rise. <laughs> I can tell who you are. <laughs> thank you very much. President Laverne, trustees, faculty, students, I want to thank you and congratulate this year's graduates of the University of Laverne's Lafetra College of Education. My name is David Miguel Villarino, the president and CEO of the Farmworker Institute of Education and Leadership Development a nonprofit founded in 1978 by Cesar Chavez, who happens to be my father-in-law. Since starting it up in 2000, we've served approximately 60,000 low-wage, low-skill workers, Latinos and African-Americans with English as a second language, a high school charter school called Escuela Popular Instituto Campesino, EPIC, probably easier to say, than Cesar Chavez, and of course, as it was stated earlier, a local youth conservation corps that performs environmental restoration. We're in 27 communities around the state of California. Um, let me just make a quick public announcement before I, be, uh, I go further. Uh, any of you that are interested in either being an administrator with field or a teacher, multiple subject teacher with field, or if you'd like to be a counselor with field, please contact uh, Dr. Kimberly White Smith give you your name and address and she'll forward it. <laughs> Before I begin with my remarks though, I want to acknowledge and thank a few people. First, Dr. Devora Lieberman, president of the University of Laverne for her foresight, her commitment to the community at large and her outstanding leadership. <laughs> I also want to Recognize and thank Dr. Kimberly White-Smith for her inno innovative and fearless leadership as Dean of Lafitra School of Education. <laughs> but I also want to acknowledge somebody as part of the staff at Laverne, Dr. Nora Dominguez. Where are you at, Nora? Please stand. Come on, no le fregues. Want to recognize her for her transformative leadership 
as Laverne's regional campus manager in California's Central Valley. Thank you, Nora, for all your hard work over there. I would be remiss if I didn't recognize somebody here among us today that's really special and dear to my heart, Liz Chavez Villarino. <laughs> Wife, partner, best friend for over 40 odd years. I've had the good fortune to work with Caesar from 1970 until his passing in 1993. And it's funny that I should be, uh, be invited to address this commencement because, uh, about education because I'm usually asked about being his bodyguard for five years, where in the mid-70s, the FBI had informed us that the mob was trying to assassinate him. Or I'm asked how his daughter and I managed to remain married for these 40 odd years. Both things were and are very, really hard to do, but both add value to today's remarks about education and negotiations, organizing, and especially service. Relative to marriage, I used to hear Caesar give a lot of consejos, advice, to newlyweds about how it took, it was gonna take a lot of negotiations to maintain your relationships. However, my wife Liz and I, we negotiated our own deal, which we can summarize as essentially, whoever asked for the divorce had to take the kids. <laughs> well, our, our kids didn't find it too funny, but, but it seemed to work. <laughs> so I accepted the invitation to address today's uh, graduates because of the similarities in the vision and the core values of our farm worker leader, Cesar Chavez and the farm worker movement, and that of the vision and core values of Laverne as it related to service. Things like innovation, opportunity, and si se puede. Yes, we can. That's a term that some president borrowed a while back. <laughs> and, and seriously, he, he knew our people in Chicago when he was a community organizer, and he, you know, he thought he was all bad, so he borrowed it. Let's take the, the core value of, of opportunity. Here, the story of Laverne's Dr. Dominguez exemplifies it best. She grew up working in the fields as a child laborer. She was a single mom. She chose to re-enter education as an adult. And she is now a leader in rural communities that has thousands of people picking up their heads, looking at her proudly and saying, si se puede. This is just like all of your stories that are out here. Take the core value of innovation. We define it as the active pursuit of new ideas. For us, we believe that the purpose of education is not so much to give people new skills. It, it is that, obviously, but for the most part, we believe that people already have the skills. What we found is what they usually lack is the confidence to use those skills that they already have. And so this is the purpose of education, to give people the confidence to use those skills. But to innovate, we as educators must admit that we don't know everything. We, as educators, must admit that people have experience apart from our own. And just like us, our students' experiences inform their beliefs. So it is our job to listen to our students. And that means we have to have humility. Don't expect you're gonna go out there thinking you're all bad and stuff, uh-uh. Because only by being humble are you able to listen. And only by listening can we change our approach to our students, both for their learning objectives and to integrate new ideas. That's why the movie McFarland was so important to document. Any of you seen that movie, McFarland? Raise your hand, you guys seen it? It was all about farm workers. It was all about change. And that's exactly what I'm pointing to. 
The coach couldn't make headway with the students, with his, with his athletes, until what? Until he went with them early in the morning to pick cabbage. He couldn't gain credibility with, with the family until he met the family. And he ate their food. And he suffered a little in their daily lives. He humbled himself. That's what it takes. Caesar used to tell us, you got to go out and touch farm workers. you got to feel that sun on the back of your neck. you got to feel that, you got to taste that pesticides that's being sprayed. You have to be able to get out there and smell that dust, shake their hands and feel that grape juice mixed with dirt. If you were going to represent them, if you were going to teach them. This was the basis for Caesar's core values. Because core values represent who we are and what we stand for. Let's take the current state of recent immigrant Latino students. Our research shows that 50% of recent immigrants from Mexico have a sixth grade level of education. And 27% are illiterate in their own language. So how in the world are the parents supposed to help their children with reading and writing? So they don't. And as a result of the family's experience with their education, it's usually a bad one. And their belief in education suffers as well. And that's passed on to the kids, your kids. So why is this important? Because the census shows that the people who run things and own things and invent things and manage things are typically non-Hispanic whites, baby boomers. But this demographic is about 50, averages about 55 years of age, and they're soon going to retire. What, so who does the census show is expected to be the replacement workforce? Hispanics. And the largest segment of Latinos, Hispanics, is under six years of age. So, in 20 years, guess who's going to be in the workforce? But, unless something changes, they're going to be unprepared to run the economy because they drop out at a 50% rate. If they're not on reading level by the fourth grade, they're going to drop out. If they're not in algebra by sixth grade, they're not going to college. The other 50% that does graduate, graduates with a ninth grade level of education. And if they go into higher education, it's usually community colleges, and only 5% matriculate to obtain their degree. What Caesar taught us is that people don't make their educational decisions based on the facts. We all know if you have a degree, if you have a high school diploma, if you have an advanced degree, you're going to make a lot more money. People make their decisions based on their beliefs. And people's beliefs are based on their experience. In our case, with recent immigrants and farm workers, it's either based on their experience or the experience of people who they know and trust, like teachers. And as we know, it has not been good as reflected by the dropout rates, the literacy rates, the academic attainment rates of adults and their children, or the treatment of the DACA students. So if people's beliefs in education are based on their experience, then job number one as educators is to provide them with a good, positive experience. This, thank you, this will lead to changing their beliefs in themselves, in their communities, and their role in changing both. Changing people's experience with education will lead to protecting the environment, protecting our government, and protecting our economy. And it all starts with having humility in order to listen and to innovate and to take people's idea. This is where the meaning of the Cisa Puede comes from. In that sense, take a minute to think of the leaders that supported and inspired you to get where you are today. Because the people that might have inspired us as leaders, they're, they're not just the Dolores Huertas. 
or the Cesar Chavez's, or the Martin Luther King Jr.'s, or the Mohandas Gandhi's, but also the leadership of Black Lives Matter, the leadership of Me Too, and the leadership of the Dreamers. In my case, I was born and raised in San Diego. I was inspired by the, by the story of, of a guy, a local farmer leader. At that time, the school board in Lemon Grove, you know, a, a, a farmer community at that time, was segregating white kids from Mexican kids by sending Mexican kids to school in a refurbished barn. In response, this guy organized his union members. It was called Mutualistas, not really a union, but something like that. And they started a boycott of the school district. They held out 300 kids for something like three or four months. You know how much money that is? Anybody here can calculate that by ADA? It's a lot of bread. And so they sent the sheriffs to threaten the parents to be deported. So this organizer got all pissed off and he went to the federal district court and filed a lawsuit. And in 1931, the federal district court in San Diego ruled that the school had to desegregate it's the first successful desegregation lawsuit in the United States. It was done by Mexicans, it was done by farmworkers, and it was done by my grandfather, Juan de Dios. Thank you. All of these stories in education represent the core value of Si Se Puede. Yes, we can. So what's the meaning of Si Se Puede? We define it as serving others through organizational and individual spirit that promotes confidence, courage, and risk-taking. Yes, you heard right, risk-taking. Because you have to take action. Listen to me, you have to take action to bring about change. And this requires leadership. Our society doesn't need no hashtag activist stuff. We need real action, one-on-one -on -one interaction with human beings. We need educators to be organizers. You're the best organizers I've ever seen in my career. Teachers, the best. We need educators to be organizers, enablers, who can inspire others to adopt and embody things like Caesar's spirit of courage to build confidence in others in order for them to serve. But being a leader in education, it can't just be about making money. If that at all is, if that's all it is, then paquechi, paquechi wawa. <laughs> if that's all you want, then brothers and sisters, you need to go into another profession. Because if it's not in your hearts, you're not going to be able to fool people very long. They're going to find you out that it's not really your priority. Because it's your job to change your students' experience by making their little victories a big deal. It's your job to build their confidence. And it's your job to have the humility to listen to their ideas, to recognize their leadership, and to motivate them. Because just like Caesar and Dolores taught us that if the workers don't organize, it's not the workers' fault. It's the organizers' fault. Because we didn't do a good enough job in explaining and motivating and getting them out there. And so too, it's not the students' fault. It's our fault. So remember the point of it all is that to serve others through a personal and organizational spirit of confidence, courage, and risk-taking. It's not easy, and many of us probably won't be able to do it. But that's the discipline. This is the fight that's worth fighting. This is the fight that's wor worth picking. This is called the good fight. And in closing, we need to recognize and thank our professors, our admissions and record staff, our financial aid staff, the maintenance and the groundskeepers and all the other service staff, all of them who made our time here memorable. And especially, 
We need to recognize and thank the people who represent the faces in conversations at our nightly dinner table, our loved ones. Class of 2018, congratulations on your most recent academic accomplishment. Thank you, and si se puede. Let me, uh, let me teach you all something real fast. Let me teach you something real fast. It's called a farm worker applause, and I insist. Sígame los buenos, como dicen. It starts out slow, and then it rapidly builds. Sígame. Que viva la Fetra graduates! Que viva la Vern! Muchísimas gracias. Please join me in thanking uh, David once again for that incredible, inspirational address. <laughs>